Date wine. It's not just for first dates. When I first heard someone say they want to date wine, I thought they meant like, you know, for on their first date. And I thought, well, isn't, wouldn't that just be whatever wine you have on your first date? Kind of like, you know, Italian wedding soup. It's whatever soup they happen to be serving at the wedding that day. But um, no, it's actually a wine made from dates. We discovered dates, what, like a year ago? We bought some just to try. We we're like, wow, they're really good. I think we were looking for high fiber foods and it came yeah. up on the list. And so we're like, wow, where have these been in all our life? They're not just like a big raisin. They're actually much more it's, complex. It's like a candy. Yeah. So we made a raisin wine several weeks back, like a month ago. And it was kind of a spoof, kind of a joke. And I kept saying, we're going to make a real raisin wine. Well, you know what? I decided let's make date wine instead. It's very similar. I would... I would actually say you could probably just substitute the dates for raisins and make the wine. It'll probably be good. Won't taste exactly the same. No. Um, okay, so what you want to do to do this is we have two pounds of Medjool dates. If I'm saying that wrong, I am very sorry to anyone that would be offended by that. But it's M-E-D-J-O-O-L. That's Medjool. I'm an American. That's how it comes out. And you're going to need some black tea. You're going to need a lemon. Actually, just the peel. But that's okay. But right now... That's not a lemon. That's an orange. She's right. This is an orange. The lemons are yellow. <laughs> anyway, what I need to do now is chop up these dates. And as you know, this is not my favorite thing to do, but I'm going to speed it up so you get to see the whole thing. And as I do that, I'm pulling the seeds out. And I probably don't want to use my good knife anymore. Totally forgot there was seeds in these. The last ones we got didn't have seeds in them. Did they? All right, I cut up all the dates. I have to make a statement. That was one of the most unpleasant food preparation things I've done in a very, very long time. But they do have these pits inside that you want to take out and don't use a good knife for it because I think I chipped mine, not sure. Anyway, we're going to move all of this out of the way. And now what we want to do is put some hot water over these. This is water that's just fresh off the boil pretty much, and I'm pouring it over. And generally you want to let this steep for about a half an hour. You can go a lot longer if you want to, and that's perfectly okay. But it all actually ends up in the brew anyway, so it's not critical to go a super long time couple things to talk about while this is steeping. First, we did make a cup of tea. What kind of tea did we end up using? PG today? Tips. This is PG Tips tea today. And it's just a regular eight ounce mug or whatever ounce mug that is. It's not critical. It's been steeping for 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so. It's perfectly okay. It'll cool down. It's fine. We will remove the bag when it goes into the fermenter. It's all for adding tannins. A lot of people are asking all the time, oh, can I use this tea or this herbal tea? Well, you can use whatever kind of tea you want. Just know that it won't be the same result. It's not about the flavors in the tea as much as black tea has a lot of tannins. That's exactly what we want. We want that kind of almost an astringent mouthfeel to add to the super sweetness that's going to come from these dates. Now, the dates themselves are going to have a bit of tannins because they have their rinds, but because we know they have such a high sugar content that that tannin essence really wasn't going to come through as strong as we'd like. That's why we're adding the black tea. By the way, if you thought they looked gross before, they look even worse underwater. <laughs> let, me, let, let me show you that. See, check that out. I mean, does that look like something that you really want to put in your mouth? I don't think so. All right, some other words about dates. They are roughly two-thirds of their weight in sugar when they're dried. So this is something we took into consideration when we created this recipe. Let me go through the recipe plan for you. We did a video on this, but I want to give you another example. So, for instance, we used two pounds of dates, right? And I'm going to show you two different ways how that number, two-thirds, is accurate for the amount of sugar. First, if you take two pounds and multiply it out, it comes to about 1.3 to 1.4 to be two-thirds, right? 1.3 to 1.4 pounds, that is. But now let me go by what it says on the package. Each package said it was 11 servings at 27 grams each. That comes to a total of 594 grams, or 1.3 pounds. So, 
Ta-da! There you go. Science, math, they work. But anyway, that 1.3 pounds gives us a 1.060 starting gravity with just the dates alone. Could we make a wine from that? Yes. It will probably go very dry though, and I tend to like sweet wines. There's two ways that we can go about fixing that gravity and getting it to a higher level. We can just use twice the number of dates, which then would be like our raisin wine, and I really didn't want to go through that again. Or we could just use some sugar. We're just going to use plain old sugar. I think ours is like a raw cane sugar, so it's a little bit brownish, almost like a Muscovado sugar. My target gravity for this is 1.124. Now, if you're wondering how I got that, if I take the yeast we're going to use, which is 71 beast or 71 B that has a 14% alcohol tolerance. If I divide 14 by 135, which is the coefficient for alcohol, we get 1.124 or thereabouts for uh, an original gravity. If I take that 1.124 number and subtract the 1.060 that's already in the dates, by the way, that's really hot. I get 0.064 left. 0.064 divided by 46 points per pound per white sugar, and we get 1.4 pounds of white sugar. For those of you that didn't get all that, I'm going to do a write-out of the whole thing right here, right now. So there you have it. Two pounds of our dates and 1.4 pounds of white sugar. Very, very simple. Now I know what some of you are thinking. 71 Beast didn't get its name by being all tame and going to just 14%. Well, here's what I did. I actually built in 20 points into that so that it could go a little higher, but it can also be a sweet wine at 14%, which we like. So even if it fermented all that out, what do I do? Back sweeten. No big deal. Forget about it. <laughs> so some things that we can do while we're waiting. I can get my orange prepared. This is not a lemon. This is an orange. And I'm just going to take a couple of swaths of peel. I don't want too much pith, just peel. And uh, I can throw that right into this hot water. Why not? Living dangerously today. Boiling our orange peels. Who would have thunk? How much am I using? Half a lemon's worth, maybe? Orange. Yeah, half an orange worth. I got a lemon on the brain. I don't know why. <laughs> but you might think, well, what's that going to do? And why not just use orange juice? Well, there's a lot of reasons. First, what will this do? It will not add an orange flavor overall to it. It will add a little tiny bit of acidity. It will add just a touch of a citrus note to kind of balance the super sweet dates. Because these things are just like, it's like biting into sugar. I mean, they're just pure sugar almost. So that little bit of citrus note. We didn't want to go too heavy on the acid though, because we knew right. we were bumping up the tannics. And with the pyramid of flavor, if you, uh, you have your base notes, which is the dates in this case, and then the tannins and acids are the highlights that are going to accentuate that base flavor. So when you're adding the tannins and acids, you want to lean to one side or the other. You don't want to have them balanced or it just gets too discordant. Okay, so you're supposed to steep this for like 30 minutes. It's been like 20 minutes and I'm getting impatient. So we're just going to dump it into the fermenter and, and let it go. It's still going to be extracting and the figs are still going to get their thing. The purpose in doing this was just to hydrate the figs a bit so that they didn't suck up all the liquid later on. Now, we do know that this is very hot liquid and we do know that this pitcher doesn't like to pour very well. So this is going to be dangerous. Not as dangerous as she thinks. <laughs> in. Not the tea bag though. Don't put the tea bag in. And don't squeeze the bag. Just saying. Don't squeeze the bag. Are you ready? No. Tip it some more. Okay. Did I get a spoon or something? Yeah, worked mostly. So now we have a spoon. We're going to try this again. Oh, 
There's just no neat way to do this. Something I want to talk about, the little big mouth bubbler. We can't get them from Amazon. They don't sell them. So they just come from Northern Brewer. A lot of people have been asking for a link. We don't actually have a special link. So just go to Northern Brewer and you can get them yourself. That's what we did. They're not a sponsor. But they could be. Okay, so at this point, we have a fairly hot liquid inside this fermenter and not a lot else. But what I do want to get in here is the sugar at this point so that we can mix it around. So let me get my scale. So we are adding 1.4 pounds of sugar. There we go. All right, so now we have all of our sugar in. Now I need to mix this up, which means I need my spoon of unusual size. Okay, and I'm just gonna mix it up. This is still really hot and has a lot of fruit in there. Could I have used a bag? Yes, of course I could. I don't really like using bags much. I would just rather let it sit on the bottom and just, you know, we dump that in the composter when we're done. It's no big deal. The bag has never proved to be that much of a convenience to me because you got to pull it out and it makes a mess and it's just crazy. Why not just siphon down and you're all good? Personal opinion. Your mileage may vary. People have asked about oxygenation when I'm using the stirring stick instead of shaking it up. And they're right, there's not as much oxygenation happening. If you don't oxygenate enough, you could get SO2, uh, sulfur dioxide production. I've not really had much of a problem with that. That's that rotten egg smell. So if you get the rotten egg smell, it's because you didn't oxidize enough. We don't seem to have that problem. I don't know why we don't always oxygenate a lot, so the only one that I recall getting that on was our rosemary... Rosemary Hydromel. <laughs> yep, that one stunk. <laughs> it really did. Every time I would just do the swirl to degas it a little bit, yeah, I had to apologize and blame it on the dog. And because... We don't have a dog. <laughs> and because it was a wild ferment and the yeast was was hanging off of the rosemary, really we were just like, is this wrong? No, it's just doing its thing. <laughs> I think it's just the reflection. Yeah, it's hard to tell if the sugar's gone or not because there's so much stuff in here now. All right, I'm going to leave the spoon in there for the moment because it's just nasty. Come on. Do you want to rinse it off with some water? Well, we're going to pour that water in here anyway. So, yeah, let's let's do that. So, we're going to pour put some water in. Go ahead. Oh, look at that. She's so smart. Rinsed it right off like it was nothing. But you were going to use it again anyway. Yep, I am going to use it again, so we're just going to put it here. How much water do you want? Oh, we're going to go to this line. In another video, we did measurements on all these things. You won't see that yet, but we actually shot it before this. Um, and we found out that in this particular, which is supposed to be a 1.4 gallon, one gallon's about here, but up to the rim up here, actually, no, it was like it right was, to here, yeah. was 1.5 gallons. Now, I'm expecting to get a lot of lease on this, so there's going to be some wastage. What am I actually wasting? Water. That's it. And let me explain how that works. I put in enough to get a gallon of wine out of this, right? There's going to be a lot of lees sitting at the bottom. About that much, probably. Easily that much. Where there's going to be some amount of wine in there, but it's also mixed with all the stuff that precipitates out of a brew. So I got one gallon. Now, some people will say that I wasted wine. No, I didn't. I wasted the extra water that I put in to make up for the distant difference of that fruit. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. What I want to do now is give this a quick stir, because the bottom is hot, the top is not. What I want to do now, though, is get a temperature reading, just to make sure that we don't shock the yeast and possibly kill it. Looking good. We're at 99 degrees. So this is a little bit on the warm side. It's all right. It doesn't really make that much difference. You can look it up online and there are adjustments for hydrometer readings. But uh, in this case, we're not taking a hydrometer reading because what are we going to take a reading of? Some of the sugars that came out of the dates and the sugar that we added. But what about the rest of the sugars? It wouldn't be accurate, so we're not even going to bother. That's why I went with a target and calculated what's in there. Now, I also know it's not going to be 100% effective at getting every single bit of sugar out of there. But that's what the extra 20 points was for, and that's what back sweetening is for. No big deal. But it's good to have an idea and plan it out so we know approximately where this can go. 
We also don't have a priority on what our alcohol amount no. is in this. We always prioritize flavor over everything. Absolutely. So once the visual effects of fermentation stop, we're going to go ahead and take a hydrometer reading then, mm -hmm. just as a reference, because then we're going to wait a week and take another one and compare those two notes to see if, it, if fermentation is complete. Right. Now, you can do this as a wild ferment. However, not the way we did it. By adding all that hot water to the dates, we killed off any wild yeast that might be there. So instead, I am going to be using Lalvin 71 Beast, also known as Lalvin 71B. And I just happen to have a half packet of it. <laughs> it's like the running joke, half packet of Lalvin 71B. I probably have five of them in the fridge. And I'm just going to sprinkle this right in, unceremoniously so. It doesn't really matter. And as we've been doing lately, because even though there's a lot of nutrition and things in here, I'm, you know, I just have really found that adding yeast hulls has been beneficial. So we're going to add a, tea, a half teaspoon of yeast hulls to this. Half teaspoon is the prescribed amount for a one gallon batch. Probably could have gotten away with a little bit less, but hey, you know what? We'll have some really happy yeast. This is, of course, optional for those of you playing along at home. Oh, yeah. You don't have to put the yeast holes in. It, it seems to be helping with the ferments that we've done it in, though. So I, I've started take, uh, taking a liking to it. And we got to do a test on that. Yeah. We plan to. We keep saying that, but we're really going to do it. I, I just want to break that up a little bit, mix it in. By the way, this smells wonderful already. You get the sweet, sugary, almost a smoky smell from the, the dates mixed with that little bit of a citrus hit from the orange. It's actually really, really nice already. I think this is going to be a great wine. I'm going to put the lid on it. Try not to cross thread it. People have been asking us about these fermenters and what we think. So far, I would say that the fermenter itself is very high quality. Okay. The glass is thick. People have said that they were thin. I think that's an old style. The new style, they are thick. What you want to be very careful of is if you put a warm liquid in and let it cool, you want to make sure that you tighten this down because it is plastic and the glass seems to shrink faster than the plastic. We have found that after cooling, many times we'd have to tighten it further. Yeah, the seal being that it's like a foam rather than a real silicone doesn't seem to be as effective as some that we've seen. This is better than the buckets we were using. I will say that. More expensive too, but much better than the buckets. I'm much happier with this. I like the airlock setup and things like that. There's a lot to really like about this fermenter. I just really wish that the seal was a little bit better. That's probably my only real gripe. Other than that, the glass and everything is beautiful. I think these are really great fermenters. The size is like perfect. So what's gonna happen now? It's gonna sit. For anywhere from an hour to a day. Depends on how long it takes for this sucker to start up. If it starts up pretty quickly, you'll see this in just a few seconds, and it'll we'll show the activity and talk about the rest of the things. If not, it'll be like a day. But for you, it's still going to be in like five seconds. And we're back. It's been about an hour and a half. As you can see, some things have occurred. Now, something else I'm realizing is there's going to be just a ton of lease in here. So we're going to end up racking this twice, easily twice. It'll be like the strawberry jam wine that you haven't seen yet either. But that had a ton of fluffy lease in the bottom that we're just going to rack it out. No big deal. I'm expecting to get about a gallon out of this. We're up past the gallon mark. But let me show you what's going on inside. First, looking at the airlock, I mean, obviously it's bubbling. There's no doubt. Every once in a while it lets out like three bubbles too, which is kind of, kind of neat. But as we start looking down inside the fermenter, obviously, foam. I mean, that's a sure sign right there. It's foaming up. That's a Croissant forming right there. We might even need a blow-off tube for this one again. But as we start getting down inside, now you can start seeing some of that wispy lease in the bottom there. That's the stuff that we don't really like seeing. It just takes up a lot of space, and it's just kind of a pain. So what's going to happen next? It's going to sit. <laughs> And after that, it's going to sit some more. No. <laughs> um, what we're going to do is we're going to keep an eye on it. Brian's going to give it the swirl every once in a while to like make right sure now. that everything is agitated well. Um, I expect... Oh. Probably making more of a mess. Yeah. Anything. And 
So after we stop seeing any signs of fermentation, we're going to go ahead and take a hydrometer reading. And then we're going to wait a week and take another hydrometer reading because we don't have a basis to determine what the actual gravity is. We're not really concerned about the alcohol percentage. What we're concerned about by taking those two readings is if the fermentation is actually done. Because as we said many times before, just because there's no activity doesn't necessarily mean it's done. And just because there is activity doesn't necessarily mean it's not done. It's those numbers that are going to tell you the facts about whether it's done or not. Now, something interesting just happened. As I shook this up, Derek had noticed that it went to a negative pressure. It filled up the, the wrong side of the airlock. And I took the airlock out and reapplied, and I'm thinking it could be a little bit of a seal issue in here, which we talked about, that they could have that problem. I don't really know. It doesn't really matter all that much to me. I like watching the things on the side, the Croissen forming, stuff like that. Those are more or less your signs of fermentation. But at this point, like she said, this is going to sit. It's going to sit for a while because, you know, it's going to take some time. But what you're going to see next in the next installment is going to be all the measurement that we do, where we check it, then we wait a week, check it again. Then you're going to see us rack it probably twice, maybe even three times, who knows. Then you'll see it bottled, and that'll be all in the next video. So it's going to be a little while. People have been asking us lately, oh, so where's the installment of this? Where's the installment of that? And, well, we've decided that having fewer videos seems to work better for most people. So that's why we went that way. Uh, if that changes, we might go back to the old way, but I don't think so. I, I like this because we get to show you all the steps along the way a little bit better rather than showing you a 30 second video saying, hey, we checked it, and that's it. Um, but uh, if you like this video, we have a few hundred videos on our channel of how to make wine, cider, mead, and beer. We also have two sister channels, City Steading Garden and Grow and City Steading Bread and Beyond. Thank you for liking and subscribing. As always, thanks for watching. Have a great day. Bye-bye.